So hello everybody, my name is Ross McKeechee. I'm lucky enough to be joined here today with Sarah Edmondson. She's the author of the new book, Scarred, the true story of how I escaped Nexium, the cult that bound my life. Uh, it's a really wonderful book. I highly recommend it to anybody and we're gonna delve into a, a little bit about it today. Sarah, thanks so much for taking the time to yeah, join us. Thanks for having me. And I just wanna say uh, thanks for the courage that you've had to come out with your story. Thank you. Thanks. Um, if I may, I wanted to start with the poem sure. that you wrote at the start of the book. Yeah. And um, find a little bit out from mm -hmm. you about where that came from. So just everybody can hear this short little poem that Sarah has at the start of the book. It's called The Scar. It's fading now, reminds me that he never owned me. Their silence erodes the memories of our friendship and leaves me naked. Where was I before I met you? Floating and eager, too young to catch the flags. My heart, open and pure, I have love around my neck. Me too. Their voices merged around me and held my hand so I could speak. Before I leave to heal, I plant barbed wire between us and wrap myself in cashmere sheets. I'm back, ready for the leaves to turn, to start again. I've never heard anyone else read my, that poem. <laughs> it's kind of interesting, but it, yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's really beautiful and it, um, yeah, it, when I first opened the book and started reading that really captivated me and I immediately felt a kind of a heart connection with you and so I'm just curious to know what was going on for you when you wrote that poem. Wow, thank you for saying that. Um, well, I was in a creative writing class and I just left Nexium, and my mom is a, is a creative writer and she's it was sort of like a mother-daughter invitation. And also I just wanted to get back to things that were nurturing. I'd, I'd read that it was a good way to heal from trauma is to, to focus on like a, you know, a hobby or something you've been meaning to do. And so I went to this class and I, the, it was, I was given an exercise. I forget the exact exercise. I think it was like a template of a structure for a poem. And that just came out of me. Like I didn't edit it or fix it in any way. In fact, I submitted it at the end of the class for, you know, feedback and she had some questions like, who is he and what are they? And I'm like, I don't really care if anyone knows that or not. Like, this is what it, I know who he, who he is and I don't mm. want to put his name there. And I know who my friends are, my former friends. And um, it just spilled out as much of the writing did. It, it was, it was just there bubbling at the surface and the feelings I had leaving were so uh, like I couldn't, yeah, it was really difficult to put it into words. And so the creative writing class created a space for me just to, you know, get it out. And I, when I wrote that, I was like, it just captured so much of where I was at that time, like feeling so devastated about my, my community that, it, that was, wasn't talking to me, you know, shunning me, um, feeling just ready to move on and, and feeling very, uh, said I have love around my neck, like it's so in the book, <clears throat> that's the necklace. I'm not wearing it today because I couldn't find it on oh. my way out the door. <laughs> um, but I'm wearing another special necklace. But it's um, there's a story in the book about. Did you get to that part? I didn't. You get get, to that you'll part. get to. It has a very specific meaning. Wearing love around my neck, um, which I'll save for you. For yeah, a good treat. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's um, yeah. It was uh, just part of my healing process. Mm -hmm. One of the stages. Back when I was really emotional, I think I'm kind of out of that stage. I'm more in the, like, just moving on with my life, and I'm not angry anymore. I've, for, I've forgiven, you know, I forgive everybody in a, in a, in a heart way. Like, yeah. in a legal sense, things need to be taken of care course. of. But I don't, I don't hold anger towards anyone anymore. Yeah. So, that captured that moment. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, sure. What you just said about forgiving everybody, mm -hmm. this brings me to a really big point about um, sort of a, the cult mentality mm -hmm. and how they can take certain spiritual or personal development terms mm -hmm. and then sort of warp them for their own purposes. Yes. 
the term forgiveness is one that we often hear and I find it can be taken out of context or used as a way to negate our emotions or to not deal with things. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what forgiveness has been for you in this process? Because you said heart forgiveness, but on a legal front, mm -hmm. a practical front, you need to hold people accountable. Right. Um, I agree with you that there's a lot of, whether it's new age, personal development, spiritual terms that are, and by the way, that's a whole other conversation we could have yeah. about this book and yeah. how the uh, leadership in Axiom and ESP just you know, bastardized some really wonderful things that I've, that, that's also been part of my healing is, is looking at like, okay, what is the, each concept? What was good about it? And how, how did it serve me? You know, and then what was bad about it? In other words, how did they manipulate us with that concept? But most importantly, where is it from originally? Yeah. Because when I was in Nexium, and remind me to get back to your other question in a yeah, second. Yeah, no, this is good. I'm going to go on this tangent this for a minute. This is great, yeah. So my mind works squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in Nexium, I had done a fair bit of, uh, you know, other searching and personal development, and I'd say my my spiritual journey started with reading the Celestine Prophecy when I, in the nineties. Classic. Yeah, classic, right? Banyan sold. I don't I'm know how sure. Many copies of that I'm book, sure. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, what are the books downstairs <laughs> that I read? Artist Way. Oh yeah. And I was actually in an Artist Way group when. I found when I stumbled into Nexium and then like brought my group through it, uh, through Nexium. Um, Artist Way, Power of Now. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, first sold in this store. Really? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you read the, the acknowledgments, I thank Eckhart and he came into my life as I was leaving, the week oh, I was leaving, really? and has been really instrumental into in, in helping me heal. Oh, how Separate beautiful story. Is that? Yeah, he's, he's, he's amazing and talks. Talk to me a lot about um, the concept of toxic ego, you know, and how, um, and, and, and also encourage me not to throw the baby out with the bathwater to look at what were the teachings, which are kind of just truths of the universe. So back to the, you know, the, the bastardizing of the concepts, when I got in, I was aware of, of you know, sort of the basics, but there was a whole, the way that, that Keith presented the curriculum which was, a, in, a, in essence, a very um, Eastern philosophy, mm -hmm. you know, Buddhist uh, concepts in terms of being, understanding, you know, that happiness comes from within, right? I think anyone is on a spiritual journey knows that happiness comes from within, right? Lesson number one. Lesson number one, right? <laughs> Nothing from the outside world causes happiness. But it was very confusing because it was a success program. Mm -hmm. So we were learning how to, how to have success, but that start, you start with yourself, right? And... and so what was great for me was to go, okay, I don't need my acting career to be happy or I don't need a relationship to be happy. Like that's, that's a big epiphany if you can really own that, right? But then how that was used was like, well, you don't need your acting career. Move to Albany. If you're really committed to your growth, right. you don't need any of those attachments. By the end, they, were, they really were gunning for me to move to Albany all the time and my biggest issue at the end, and I'm not sure if I really put this in the book because it, um, there was just so much. Like I was already 10,000 words over my word count. There's so many things that didn't even get into the book. But one of the things they said to me is that my, my attachment to materialism would be the reason I wouldn't grow. Basically, I was attached to my apartment and my community here and this attachment to materialism now. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like that was always used against you to, for their own, you know, yeah. whatever they were going for. So... I tangented to the answer it's your a, question. It's a great tangent. <laughs> okay. I don't even care about the question <laughs> <Okay>. anymore. <laughs> um, but it does bring me to another question, sure. which is just for our viewers, anybody who's, let's, I mean, this has been a big news story with what's going on with Keith Raniere, mm -hmm. all the charges against him. It's It's been, you know, a big thing. But for, in case any of our viewers are unaware of what is Nexium, who is Keith Raniere, just Soundbite? A soundbite. Sure. Yeah. Oh, it's so hard to put it in a soundbite. Yeah, do your best. Yeah. Well, the way I like to to talk about it, and it's if I ever meet someone that doesn't know the story, which is truly rare in Vancouver, yeah. right? Because everyone's either knows someone that was in it or was in it or pr went to an intro, right? I went to an intro. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, he dodged that bullet. Yeah. So I'm, glad we're, I'm glad you're here today. <laughs> not not on, the, on this side of things. Yeah. Um, Oh no, what was the question? Uh, uh, just the sound. Oh, oh the sound yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mom brain. Yeah. It's a legitimate thing. Legitimate. Um, 
So what, what I say to people is I was in a group for many years that I thought was really great and I was a big proponent of it. And then I found out that it wasn't good. In fact, it was the opposite of what I thought it was. And when I discovered what it really was, I decided to expose it and blow the whistle. Mm -hmm. And the leader, uh, the leadership uh, have all been held accountable, well, not all of them, but five key players have been uh, um, arrested. Uh, four out of the five pled guilty. And the fifth, which is Keith Raniere, the philosophical founder, AKA Vanguard. Vanguard. Um, is Which is what he had all of, Everybody call, call him. him. Yeah, V for short, if you were casual. Right. But Vanguard or Keith outside of the class, but mostly Vanguard. Um, he's in jail. He's everyone else is on house arrest. He did not plead guilty, but he was found guilty on all seven counts that he was convicted of: um, sex trafficking, forced labor, conspiracy. Uh, consp uh, there's I can't even remember all of them. Seven things that he was accused of, and he was found guilty on all seven charges. And he's awaiting sentencing right now in prison. Uh, in January eighteenth, yeah. I believe it is stuff that's not nice, not human, humanistic at all, which is no. what he was preaching. Right. We that's and that's really been the hardest part of this. Um, you know, can I swear on this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a it's a shit sandwich. A shit yeah. sandwich. To eat to to recognize it's a it's a real pride buster to go. Oh my God, I was wrong. Yeah. And not only was I wrong, but I was out there being a zealot about something that pushing was it pushing it right yeah right. pushing it and telling all my friends about it my family people i didn't even know and i was righteous yeah and that's the thing that's kind of gross i mean it's all gross but like just that particular thing is is a really hard pill to swallow which is also i think why there's still people in right and there's not many and when i say in they're followers of keith they think he's innocent they think that he was his unconventional methods perhaps but that right. he was really um judged unfairly by the government and there was a conspiracy committed by myself and the other people to want to take him down you know yeah. which by the way is a red flag you asked me about, yes, you asked yes. me about red flags that's the next question yes. what are some of the red flags for our audience mm -hmm. because this is a this is i mean we're hearing stories all over the place these days about cults and people abusing power which is what this book is really about not it just is. cults it's about abuses of power yeah and that's why I think it's a great book for anybody to read. I found it really, really helpful. Yeah. Good. I'm so glad. That's what I wanted. Yeah. And so I, I, um, I want to applaud you for for eating that shit sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But you eat it, and you can move on. But you have to eat it. You have to eat it. Yeah. yeah. And I think everyone get in life can relate to that in some way. Yeah. They don't have to be in a cult to to eat a shit sandwich. Yeah. Also called humble pie. Yeah, humble pie. Humble that's pie. a that's a that's a less vulgar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but maybe that's dessert. You have the shit sandwich. You can have a humble pie for dessert, <laughs> yeah, oh and then you can move on. <laughs> Just one meal. I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> but ironically, and I'm going to come back to the red flags in a yeah. second. The most ironic thing for me is that Keith, and I think he stole this from, I don't know where this is from, but other teachings, is talked a lot about character and building character and being an honorable person. Right, and that he would he would say character is not character unless it's tested, <laughs> right? And I'd be like, yeah, you know, I'm this person, I'm, and we, and I think it's true that the journey of spirituality is like to understand yourself and to connect with your highest self and and figure out who that is and express it. Yes, something like that, yeah, right? Yeah. And I thought that I was doing that there. In fact, I did do some sort of spiritual journey in my in my process with Nexium, but the biggest part was was standing up against it and figuring out that I'm that type of person, right? Okay, okay so that was a big question <laughs> yeah. I had is, now that you're looking back yeah. on it, what are the blessings? And how, you know, are you at a point now where you can say, yeah, I can see some blessings yes. from this? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm on the other side and I'm going, even though I wish I had made some different choices and I would like to remember those to move forward, I don't want to change anything because I am stronger now than I ever have been in my life. Yeah. And I know who I know my character, yeah. and I know that I will sacrifice unnecessary things. Like there's a lot of people who don't like me, right? There's a lot of people who don't like what I did, who don't like even that I'm getting any sort of attention for it. They want me to suffer because I was a proponent of Nexium. Right. Like you know, I was successful when I was in it, and I'm successful leaving it. Right. You know, like that's they're like that's not fair. No fair. <laughs> that's not fair. She should be, she should be something. Right. I don't care. Mm -hmm. And if they want to focus on that, that's their pain. 
and yeah. their jealousy and the, whatever they need to work through, we stopped him. Yeah. That's the most important thing. That is. Women were being abused for decades and nothing was being done about it. People tried. People did try. I'm not saying no one tried, but yeah. having the scar on my body was was physical proof to say this guy is doing this to people and it's not okay because emotional abuse is hard to prove, right? It is. So now I have physical abuse and then all this other emotional abuse. That, I mean, in the trial, the stories that were um, you know, revealed on the witness stand were nothing compared to what I went through. In terms of theirs were worse. Mine no, was not, was sorry, not, my, yeah. mine wasn't so bad, which I think is why I was able to even have the strength to, to speak up against it because, I mean, it, it, was, it was definitely bad. I think what happened to me was very traumatic and, you know, I've, that's been a big part of my healing is getting over that. But what he did to other women for decades behind the scenes in Albany yeah. is really, really awful. And so I'm, I'm just, I don't know, I, I, it's not what I expected. You know, I, I got into Nexium to help people and that's always been my, you know, my, my pull, my, one of my highest values is helping people. And I'm, oh, since I was little, I think in the book I talk about, I like to be the person who's like, oh, you yeah. need a lozenge or, you know, I like to be a caregiver and a mama bear, whatever you want to call it. And that, that's what I was here. I was a mama bear of a huge community. Um, Oh man, I lost my train of thought. That's okay. No, I think what we, we, there's a lot of stuff you're touching on here, and I, I had, like honestly when I was reading the book and listening to some of the CD, CBC podcasts mm -hmm. by Josh Block, mm -hmm. who, the old friend of yours, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. It's such a good podcast. Yeah, and I'm not just saying that because it's my you know my story. I think it's a really well made podcast. It is very well produced. Yeah, Do you know how twenty million people have downloaded that. I'm not surprised. It's crazy. I'm not surprised. Yeah, it's a gripping story, and yeah. he caught you right. Great as you're coming out of it, right? Yeah. It's rare. Yeah. And I, by the way, I, I grew up going to Hornby Island. Oh, too, did you? And my oh. parents live on Denman Island now. Oh, no way. Yeah. So you know the area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was, it was a, a magical a, spot. Yeah, amazing. Um, should we go back to the red flag thing? Yeah, yes. Or, or, but, but also, yes. also, the question about, I think we'll come back, mm -hmm. maybe kind of close Perhaps with it. the red flag thing and say, what do, what do people need to know? But... You, you seem to, it's almost like, I don't want to say destiny, like whatever people's beliefs are, mm -hmm. but you seem to have this protection around you, mm -hmm. reading your story where you avoided, somehow unwittingly avoided a lot of the traumatic events, not that you didn't mm -hmm. experience your own, but yeah. that a lot, of, so many of the women did. Right. Uh, because you're in Vancouver, mm -hmm. Because you focused on your own life a little bit more, and you did kind of have that underlying questioning going on. Mm -hmm. Can you just comment on that a little bit? And, sure. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if it's um, you know from a spiritual point of view or a destiny, or I mean, I have worked with an energy healer to help me heal, and that is definitely something that's crossed my mind. Is like, was I put here to be the person to take them down? You know, and and I think I was for me. Whether, whatever, whatever reason why, I don't know. But what I do know is that I had many opportunities to move there and to be closer to Keith. And that was an intuition that I couldn't have named or articulated, but it kept me, it kept, it kept me at a distance. And it allowed me to use the tools, and I say the tools lightly because I thought they were his tools, but now they're just, you know, good life and spiritual tools. Mm -hmm. It allowed me to use what I wanted in my life and not, go all in, which meant all in in ESP terms means moving to Albany and joining his harem and things like that. Living in Knox Woods. Yes, and, yeah. living in Knox Woods. And that was something, like we did have a home there, but it wasn't in Knox Woods. It was about right. 30 minutes south. Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, but I, I think I was protected. I think that I, I had a little bit of intuition left. I mean, I ignored my own intuition many times throughout the my journey there and I talk about that in the book because I wanted people to have a sense of what a red flag looks like and how our bodies can either follow that and trust that gut instinct or override it and one of the most dangerous things that they did is on the very first day of the first training they said first of all you're this is a success program right executive success program it's not very spiritual sounding but I was spiritual and I thought I was spiritual yeah. I was I was there to grow um, but they said, if you want to be successful, which I also wanted, of course. Um, all successful people know their limitations. Wouldn't you agree? Of course. This, this, this is their, this is, right. wouldn't you agree? Right. 
wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, wouldn't you agree? They were already saying, yeah, 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 I would agree. Great. So when you have a limitation that feels uncomfortable, you know, I, it, it, going growing is uncomfortable. It can be, right? Yeah. No pain, no gain. So when you're uncomfortable, it means it's an area to look at. It's an area to grow. So I accepted that as truth. Mm -hmm. Then that was a that was a my first part of my downfall, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Because I then felt uncomfortable many times in those first few days, and I didn't do anything about it. I didn't leave because I wanted to grow. And I said, "You're going to feel uncomfortable. You're going to have an urge to leave, an urge to bolt. And if you leave, you'll never work on those issues. And you paid money. Let's work on your issues." Which is basically, I'm going to accept that I'm going to stay here and let myself be indoctrinated, which I did. But I thought I was being going through your discomfort. I thought I was going through my discomfort, and that if I was going through an indoctrination or brainwashing or whatever you want to call it, it was for my own benefit. Because I did, and I still believe that we have limiting beliefs, and you probably do in your practice too. You got to bust through those, yep. and lots of people have limiting beliefs, and that's what I did in my first few days. I started busting through my own self-imposed or you know societal society-imposed limitations very, very quickly. It's like this is amazing. Which I think is what makes it so dangerous is that I got, I got hooked very quick, and I just wanted more and more and more of that. Mm -hmm. Those epiphanies and awarenesses, and back to your earlier question of like red flag. Red flags. Yeah, what's a cult versus what's a group? You know, what's a group that you're going to spend a lot of time with versus what's a destructive cult? I think when you have tools and you use them in your life, it doesn't matter where you get them from. Oh well, be careful where you get them from, but. When those tools become your life and your whole life becomes the group, I think that's one of the first things I would, I would let people, I would ask people to be wary of. When you have no outside relationships yes. or anything going on outside of yes. that community. Yeah. And, and your whole life becomes dedicated to the group. Right. And especially when um, it's for somebody else, like you're bringing in people and serving somebody else and um, maybe not getting paid. Like I see this with a lot of what's called a large group awareness training, so any sort of seminar, and there's lots in Vancouver, where people devote all their time to coach and to help run it, and they don't there's, they don't get paid, but somebody else is getting paid. Right. You know, that's a problem for me, I think. Yeah. You know, they're like, well, I'm doing it in service. Like you said, service can be a good thing, mm -hmm. but I think also people get taken advantage of, and they can run their company, you know, for free, essentially, if they have a bunch of people that want to just volunteer their time. But if they're if they're doing that all the time and they've abandoned their other life, yeah. so that's the other thing. So it's not just one of these things; it's a right. combination. Yeah. If people uh, know someone who, like, all of a sudden they don't want to pursue X, Y, and Z hobby and career because they're now doing this, just that, just that, that's that's a red flag. Okay. Um, so so far we've got if you're asked to completely dedicate your life and mm -hmm. cut off outside ties, and mm -hmm. if you're removing all of these other things that you're passionate mm -hmm. about and only dedicating yourself yes. to this kind of mm -hmm. removing those things that make you joyful personally, yeah. right? Your little mm -hmm. gifts and all those things. Yep. Okay. Um, if the if there's any sort of outside um, pressure against the group, like there's been accusations of anything nefarious, how does the group handle that? Yeah. Do they say this is, you know, they're just attacking us because they don't understand, that they don't get it? Like in any kind of us versus them, like we get it, our group gets it and the other outside doesn't. Any Anything that make, that villainizes the outside world, right. I think, is a, is a red flag. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, and if, if there is legal action, how how is it handled? You know, was it was it brushed under? Because there was so much legal stuff against Nexium the whole time I was there, and I naively believed that it was because Keith was so smart and such a noble humanitarian man there was going to be pushback. Because look what happened to Jesus. Right. Look what happened to MLK. He's look like at, a martyr. He's a martyr, yeah. I mean, he, and, and the world's not ready for his genius. Of course they're going to try to take him down, yeah. accuse him of underage sex. Like, right. that's, of course they're going to do that because that's the worst thing you can do. He would never do that. Of course not. No. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's so it's so obvious to see it, to yeah. see it now. But in those moments, and that's another thing I'd say for a red flag, if, they, if there's an encouragement to not research the group, or to not watch documentaries that have been made about the group, that would be, I would say, go watch the documentary. Yeah. And and you can ask questions, but I would say if you get the sense that you're in a group that is a cult, don't ask questions and just leave. Yeah. Because if you ask questions, and if you had asked questions in the past, that's another red flag, and, and get any kind of shame, um, sh getting shamed for asking questions, for not believing, not being a true believer, or, or you know, you get punished in some way, for questioning the leadership, that's a massive red flag. 
So there's red flags for people who are in it, and yeah. then there's red flags for people who know know people. Like if you know someone who goes into a seminar or a workshop or a training, and then they come out and they they seem very different. They've had a big personality shift. That's a big red flag. Like they're totally different. Totally different. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, and it's true that you can take a workshop and have a lot of shifts, and that's great. But, you know, what, what, what's what's really, how did that happen, and right. who's benefiting? I yeah, guess, is and question. is it, are they just riding that group energy, drinking the Kool-Aid? Yes, for, and, yeah. yeah. Which I do think, you know, can be inspiring. I see a lot of people go to different trainings and like, yeah, I can change my life, and then they go back to their previous self very quickly. Yeah. Which is something that we thought in Nexium we didn't do that we were really creating permanent change. You're right. Yeah. I want to. I what I want. I think a big takeaway mm-hmm. for our viewers out there and for anybody is, if you're in the middle of it, mm-hmm. can you just talk a little bit about your experience? Because through the book, you you mention a few times where you had this strong feeling to mm-hmm. bolt, mm-hmm. to get out, but then there would be just one little thing that the pulled key. you back in. Um, can you comment on that a little bit? Sure, yeah. So, you know, obviously looking back, I can. the red flags are so obvious, and that's part of the, the sandwich and the humble pie. Um, but the things that kept me in were always the good stuff, mm. you know, the community, the people. Um, I mean, there was a time where all of my close friends, or most of my close friends, were in the group with me. Thank goodness I left some friendships not in Nexium that I could go back to. Yeah. Um, and it felt great. We had great parties. We had great events. We spent so much time together. We were working on our goals. We were building, like building each other, uh, supporting each other. Um, so when I heard something that wasn't right, and if I went to the to speak to somebody about it, because I couldn't talk to any of my students, so you can't, you couldn't go down in rank right. if there was a concern. You had to go up. Yeah. So generally, I'd get gaslit, or somebody would tell me some story that I would believe, and I base, you know, I, I trusted them. And that's the, that's the the problem is that all of anyone getting recruited, like if I wanted to recruit you or to enroll you, it would be based on trust. Do you trust me? Because I could yeah. say it's going to be amazing. It's going to change the world, blah, 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 all these things. I mean, assuming I'm telling the truth, if you trusted me, you'd do it, right? Of course. Um, so I trust the people who were in and it was always, and anything that was not right was Either like, you know, something negative about Keith, there was always a smear campaign. If there's something within the company, I think any company has challenges and not no company's perfect. So it's like, yeah, we're working on that, you know? So it would always be kind of brushed under the rug right. or like, we, you know, this is a humanitarian group. There's going to be failures. Yeah. Do you want to fix it or mm-hmm. do, and, and, and fix the problem or do you want to be part of the problem and, and be a suppressive? Oh. So I always want to fix it, you know? So I, I was always trying to make things better, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I stayed because of the community. I stayed because um, I thought what we were doing was good. And also, like, I wanted to be committed. Mm-hmm. And in any group, um, there's always an underlying fear of what's going to happen if you leave. Yeah. So in certain religious cults, they'll say things like, God will smite you, or you're going to go blind, like an extreme. Um, it's like the exit uh, benefit, or not benefit, the exit cost of leaving a group, mm-hmm. right? For us... And I was like, I don't really have that. This is a, a cult therapist asked me to think, like, what would happen if you leave? And I was like, what I realized is that I believe that if I left, I wouldn't work through my issues. I wouldn't uh, evolve. Right. right. And that was one of the most important things to you. Yeah. But personal development and my growth became the most important thing. It trumped everything else, which I don't think is actually good. Like, my right now, my family is the most important thing. Right. Right? It's, yeah. a, different, it's a different, you know, hierarchy, yeah. which is also important. What are your values and what, what what's their hierarchy? Um, one of the things that always kept me in was wanting to, like other people had left along the way, and some people left quietly, and but in internally the higher ranks would say, well, they never worked their issues, and like they're still uh, they're right. going to go out into the world and still have that with them. It's like a big, you know, ugly wart. You want to get you want to work on that. You don't want to go back out into the world with that thing that you that's hampering you. Yeah. So even to this day, I'm still that comes up for me. It's like, what did I not work on there? As a, and, and that's also part of my healing is accepting who I am as who I am and not this problem that needs to be fixed yeah. with more trainings. That's another red flag. Yes. If, you, if your group exposes something in you that you can only heal within that group, 
We and have the answer. We have the answer, and that's the only path. That's a problem. That's a big problem. There's lots of paths, yeah. and you should be able to, and there's another thing, you should be able to do it, whatever you want in any group. If you feel like you can't leave the group or you're asked to um, shun or not speak to people who leave the group, that's a major red flag. Yeah. That's like call it 101. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the idea of the inner deficiency, mm -hmm. that was their terminology yes. for it, right? Mm -hmm. So they use that idea that you are inherently deficient within and that just kind of keeps you, you're always having to yeah. keep going. There's a never ending cycle. Well, yeah, you want to, you want to solve the deficiency. You right. want to feel better about yourself. I mean, even they, I mean, they would say that it's not, you know, I think we all knew that it was just a feeling, mm -hmm. but you, there was a, there was a tool set and a path to evolve that feeling with an axiom. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's just so much we could cover. I, mean, I, I, I wish we could, yeah, I wish I we, mean. I wish we could do a Banyan books in conversation special on cults and, mm -hmm. and what to look out for, because I think it's just such a useful thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I want to thank you again for um, your path and your courage and everything that you're sharing. And from what I've seen, you're a person who, eat, when you were in Nexium, you somehow stayed clean, mm -hmm. you know, relatively, mm -hmm. and, and you were doing, you were uplifting people. Mm -hmm. And now that you're out, you saw the you saw through what was going on. You're out, and you're using your story to uplift and mm -hmm. serve people. So thank you for that. Um, thank you. Yeah, and I I just want to know what's next for you. What what are you focusing on? You know, I'm I'm not sure yet. Yeah. I um I I kind of thought that writing the book it would be really cathartic, which it has been, and yeah. then I could get the information out there and and people could uh, read it. And really, that is the main thing. Is this is a template. This is a template for, for anyone to understand how cults, and not just cults, abuses of power work. And, you know, like I said to you when, we, when I first walked in, I got this bonus education mm -hmm. and have received so much help from experts and from um, people in, in cultic studies. And now I, I, I want to, again, I want to share it with people because mm -hmm. I don't want anyone to go through what I went through. And when I, when I went joined this group, there wasn't um, any education about it and it wasn't as as kind of trendy as it is now like right now there's so many documentaries about cults and you know wild wild country about yeah. osho holy hell, holy hell <laughs> about beautiful i mean it's um glowing clear about scientology yeah. and there's a new um wave of people trying to understand it and i want them to understand it and also know that it is okay to join a group and pursue a path of whatever, but be careful, you know? Yeah. And like I said, don't try to recruit me into, yeah. <laughs> into yours, but I'm so happy it's working for you. And just, you know, be careful. And that's all I really I really want, I wanna help people with. Um, and I just don't know how much that's gonna be my whole life, I guess, yeah. to answer your question. Yeah. Um, acting is difficult with two children. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. You're I, a mom, you got a lot going I got a, on. I got, yeah, being a, being a mom of two kids is a full time, you know? thing in and of itself but um just i'm right now 2019 is healing just the rest of this year healing a lot of um you know whatever's left and then 2020 we'll see it's beautiful yeah yeah thank, thank you so much for joining us thank you for us, your great Sarah. questions i'm um, so glad that we got to meet and i i super appreciate your uh, insightfulness and openness and your humanity thank you <laughs> thank you thanks so much so everybody, Sarah will be giving a talk, a free talk at Banyan Books on uh, January 31st, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. Her book, Scarred, is available in our store and anywhere that sells books. For those who prefer listening, it's also available on Audible. And I do it. I do the narration. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like kind of like hanging out with me for eight hours. Yeah. And she's got a great voice. <laughs> she's done voiceover training, acting, mm -hmm. and... Um, so yeah, Banyan Books in Conversation, Sarah Edmondson, go to our website, banyan.com. You can order things online if you're not able to come down to West Forth and Dunbar and Kitsilano and, and pick up whatever you like and wishing everybody a wonderful holiday season. Thanks so much. Thank Sarah. you. Happy holidays. Thank you.